Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell. The church is teaching a, pro a gospel of prosperity on earth. You're gonna drive, if you have faith, you'll drive a Bentley and you'll have a mansion. And when the time of tr for trouble comes, you're just gonna be secretly whisked away and never go through anything. Because everyone knew his, that Joseph probably couldn't have father Jesus. Jesus also had to deal with the ridicule of being a bastard child and being called names. He knew what it was like to be bullied and teased. And yet, even as a child, Jesus never sinned. God made the human heart so big that only he can fill it, right? Once you understand where Christ came from to save you, you understand that there is no person on earth, no act you can perform on earth, no video you can watch, no song you can listen to, no person you can date who could ever love you more than God does. God allows a delay to purify the church. It is a test that we must deal with this delay. Thank you so much, my friends, for taking time to click on this video. And I just want to thank you as well for subscribing, for liking, for sharing, and for joining Melville Broadcasting Network as we spread the everlasting gospel to the ends of the world. I also just want to thank you for the blessing of resources that God has given you, which you have shared with us. As I've always said, and I want to say again, Melvis' work continues to grow in leaps and bounds, and our gospel footprint has gone around the world. It is for that reason, my friends, that we need more resources to keep this ministry growing and impacting more people, and changing lives along the way. I don't want to spend a lot of your time, but I want to come back at the end of this video to share with you a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I'm hoping you can join us to bring it to pass because I believe and I feel it, my friends, that God is calling you and us to do something that will impact this world forever. So in the meantime, I just want you to relax, whisper a prayer to God, and enjoy this video. I'll see you on the end of this video. Stay tuned and God bless. Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell. Uh, we're going to get right into God's Word today. We have um, a lot to cover. We're going to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 4, which was our scripture reading. Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Our message is entitled, If God, Why Evil? If there's a God, why then in the world is there evil? And this is a part of our series on apologetics. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study a word and to deal with this most crucial issue. Lord, more than ever, today I need your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this place, and Lord, have him fill each of our hearts. Make me once again just a nail on the wall, Lord, a rusty, sorry nail. Upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Lord, Eric Walsh need not be seen nor heard today, but Lord, we do need to hear a word from the throne room of grace. Is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So just a little recap before we get into today's message. We are on apologetics. As Christians, can you give an answer for what you believe? Can you defend the faith? In fact, the text we use for this is found in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we are instructed that we are supposed to be able to give an answer for what we believe. So some of the things we talked about when we talked about the different arguments, when we're looking at defending Christianity, we first start with the existence of God. Does God exist? I'll come back to that in a second. 
We then talked a bit about the historical evidence. And you remember we quoted two great historians, the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, and we um, uh, quoted the Roman historian Tacitus, both of whom support the New Testament narrative about Christ. These are extra biblical scholars. But we also, of course, uh, went to the Dead Sea Scrolls and found that at least 100 years before the birth of Christ, the book of Isaiah was in its complete form and would translate exactly to the English we have of it today um, if you translate the book of Isaiah that they found in the, those caves in Israel, meaning the prophecies of the book of Isaiah, which are all came true in the life of Christ, especially in the birth of Christ, all of those prophecies then existed before Christ did, which means you can trust the scripture. I mean, this is one little sliver. We're going to hit that more next week. One little sliver of how prophecy um, supports the authority of the scripture. And we talked about how archaeology comes together with that. And so we talked about the authority of the scriptures as well. In fact, we quoted Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1 in speaking to the existence of God. The Bible says, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that, uh, none that are good. So we talk about the fact that uh, in the ancient days, it was the fool who said there was no God. Today, if you go to college in the United States, you're a fool if you believe in God. The whole thing is flipped on its head. Throughout antiquity, no one would have been uh, foolish enough to believe that all the universe came into existence all by itself. And you can go back and read Socrates on this. Socrates himself spoke of a transcendental being, someone who had to be higher and bigger, someone who had to exist outside of time, basically, Socrates. And obviously, we don't agree with all of the teachings of Socrates, but even Socrates understood the world could not come into existence if someone didn't cause it, someone didn't design it. And as you begin to fall away from God, one of the things that happens, of course, is that morally, man begins to fall apart. Man begins to decline. And we have seen that in our own time. But we talk about cause and effect. I was just mentioning, right? Um, and God has no cause because in order to cause God, you'd have to have an adequate cause. God is the cause. And that is where people get stuck. Some say, well, where did God come from? God doesn't come from anywhere. He has always been. That is why his name is Yahweh. When he, Moses asked him, um, whom shall I tell them sends me? He said, tell them I am sends you. When Jesus was speaking, he said, before the world was, I am. He always existed. In fact, here's how you have to understand it. God does not exist in time. God created time. And we talked a bit about natural theology and natural revelation and how nature reveals it. We talked, uh, you know, I mentioned like the bombardier beetle. I studied, I was a biology major undergraduate. When you study these things, you understand there's so much design. I talked about the flippers on whales, the, the way that the bombardier beetle can shoot fire. Uh, it's a chemical fire, but can shoot fire. Even the design of your eyes and, and sight, it would be impossible for it to randomly come into existence. By accident. But that's what they want you to believe. There is a God who created the world, who designed you. David says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. When I was in medical school, the one thing that every day when I went to class and I studied, the one thing that kept coming back to me is God is a powerful God to design man. Even something as simple as the Krebs cycle we studied um, in, in medical school in biochemistry. These things are powerful when you begin to look at how these chemical reactions have to happen. There is no way by chance these things would have evolved. We talked about the authority of the scripture and uh, the, the text for that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God's word is inspired, right? Now, the, the, actually, when you look at the, 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 the original Greek, um, you could actually say that it is expired. As God spoke, the word was breathed out. And the men who wrote the Bible breathed in. They inspired. Come on, somebody. 
And as the Holy Spirit moved on them, they were inspired to write the Bible. The Bible, I, I said this last week, the Bible is not word inspired. The Bible is thought inspired. That means that when you read the Bible, what you're asking the Holy Spirit to do is to help you to extract the thought in the verse. I have friends say, well, you know, Jesus didn't speak Greek, but the Bible is written in Greek. Doesn't matter. Greek was the lingua franca. It is an incredibly expressive language. That's why God chose it. It's different in Hebrew. Hebrew is a very creative language that, that, that uses a lot of uh, pictures and so forth. But, but Greek was the language that was chosen by God because it was the lingua franca. It was the language spoken all over the world. It was a, a language easy to write. And Paul was able to write most of the New Testament, as, uh, as the rest of the New Testament is written in Greek, because when we extract from the Greek, we get real meaning. There are multiple words for love in Greek. In English, you have one word. You say God loves you. You say your wife loves you. You say your friend loves you. It's all the same word. In Greek, each of those is a different word. It's a very descriptive language. It says God, all of scriptures is inspired by God. Why is it inspired? Verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The purpose of God's word is the purification of the character of fallen man. So as you study the word, it grates. That's why the scripture says it is sharper than any two-edged sword. This is why if you go to a church and they preach and it's really fluffy and nice and they never step on your toes, you've got to be careful. Because the word of God is supposed to be like a scalpel in the hand of a surgeon that removes, removes the malignant lesions of a, a fractured character and broken will. That's what the word of God does. That's why they hate the word of God the way they do. So we go to the Bible for our story. John chapter 9 and verse 1. Now, scripture says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. In the Jewish economy, in the Jewish way of thinking, if you were born with a, a disease like this, it was because somebody had to have sinned. It was the worst curse that could come upon you would be to be born lame or blind or whatever the case may be. So his disciples, when they see this man in verse two, the disciples asked him saying, master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The assumption, of course, is somebody is to blame. Somebody must have sinned. So that's why this guy is in the mess he's in. And that leads us to our question for the day. Why does God allow evil in the world? If, let me tell you, if you're going to defend the faith, one of the questions that is always going to come to you, every atheist is going to bring to you, is that if God is good, why is there evil in the world? And unless you have an answer for this, you will be stumped every time. So this is the question we're going to address today. This is what we're going to look at um, from a biblical perspective. How does this happen? So the Scottish philosopher, David Hume, said these words, and it's been quoted by many, um, many people many times. In fact, uh, um, they, they, they try and um, ascribe it to one of the ancient philosophers, but not so sure about that now, but this is what he said. If God is omnipotent, meaning he's all powerful, omniscient, meaning he's all knowing, all knowing, if God is omnipotent, omniscient and wholly good, whence evil? Why then is there evil, he says. If God wills to prevent evil but cannot, then he is not omnipotent. If he can prevent evil but does not, then he is not good. Hume's final assumption is this. In either case, he is not God. Here lies the backbone of the argument against our God. That if evil exists in the world, it is God's fault. And we, the Bolshevik revolution, and you study um, uh, Marx and, uh, and Engels and, and Lenin and all of these guys, one of the, the things that they kind of held in common is, um, is that they believed that religion was the opiate of the people, the opium. Like they believed that we were religious as a way to, to hide pain. 
So we psychologically, mankind, because the problem the atheist has is everywhere in the world you go, people believe in the supernatural. They may not believe in the Christian God, believe in some kind of God. They say, well, this is because man psychologically needs a crutch. They need, he needs an opiate. Now, one of the, one of the writers I'm reading now, R.C. Sproul's a great apologeticist, says the truth is you could flip that on its head. Right? You could flip that on its head. Why would the atheist not want to believe in God? Because he does not want to face accountability. Does never wants to face judgment. Because even the atheist knows that he has sinned. So this quote here from David Hume is one of the foundational pieces in the movie, um, Batman versus Superman. Or Superman versus Batman, I don't know which way, one of them. They were against each other. This is the guy who played Lex Luthor, and he literally quotes David Hume. Now, why is that relevant? Uh, you can see the picture in the background. I didn't want to blow it up too big. It's the picture of Satan falling from heaven. These movies take all of these ideas and put them in, because who watches movies like Superman versus Batman? Children. So here's a way for you to, as a parent, sit, or you know, or parents all over the world, sit with their child and have them introduced to this philosophy. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because Lex Luthor is the smartest character in all the DC universe. And here he questions God, just as David Hume did. And so we come back to the question. Why does God allow evil in the world? The answer is actually quite simple. I can answer it with two words. Free will. The reason God allows evil in the world is free will. It is because God wants man to choose him. Now, I'm going to go through about five or six things that God cannot do. To, to get back around to this point, okay? So follow me. I'm gonna, we'll go through a few things God cannot do, all right? And then we're going to come back to free will. And uh, do we really have free will, some people ask. So we're going to come back to free will. But free will means the ability to choose. It means the ability to make decisions. That's what free will means. So what, can, what God cannot do here? Number one, God cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. In fact, if God said the sky was plaid right now, guess what would happen to the sky? It would turn plaid. Hebrews 6.18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We have immutable things. Something that is immutable is something that cannot be changed. It is impossible for God to lie. Here's why that's relevant in the great controversy. Here's why that's relevant when you look at why there's evil in the world. Here's why that's relevant. Because the devil can and does lie. He has an advantage. He cheats. He lies. And so Satan has an advantage over God. God must play by his law, the rules of his law, Satan intentionally does not. So the first thing that God cannot do, God cannot lie. Number two, God cannot increase or diminish in knowledge. It is impossible for God to learn anything. In other words, he already knows everything. First John 3, 24, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Number three, God cannot be tempted with evil and cannot tempt others. So if there is um, temptation going on, God does not tempt. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and tempts no one. God does not tempt, but he does test. He does test. He allows the devil who does tempt to, test, to, to tempt, and God allows the testing to happen. A great example of that is the book of Job. Number four, God cannot change. 
God is immutable. Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. So some people say, well, God is still speaking. He's saying new things. No, he's not. God is not going to say something today that contradicts what he said in the word hundreds, thousands of years ago. James 1, 17, every gift, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There is no variation in God, no shadow of him turning or changing. He is the same. This is why you can have faith in him because when he promised you, he won't lie and he won't change. Now he changes his mind. The times in the Bible says, listen, all right, I'm going to change my mind, but he doesn't change. Number five, God cannot cease to exist. Isaiah 40 and verse 28, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he faints not, neither does he get weary. There is no searching of his understanding. This gives you a lot of things God can't do. God can't get tired, right? So when you look at the, the again, going back to the comic book universe, they, they make some of the people who represent God like Odin take these naps and so forth. They're trying to mock God as if the God of heaven could tire out. He doesn't get weary. He doesn't get tired. There's no searching of his understanding. But the sixth thing is the one we're going to focus on because this is why God created um, choice and free will in every being he created. It is because God cannot force you to love him. If you don't get anything else I tell you, get this today. The reason we have free will and the reason God gave us the ability to choose and to make decisions for ourselves is because if God made all of us robots and said, you are going to obey me no matter what, we, he would never experience our love. Oh, y'all missing this thing. So God risked it all in the great controversy by creating first the angels with free will, then creating man with free will. And he did it because God does not create so that he can be served. God creates so that he can be loved. And so he has to give you choice. And throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, if you gave everybody choice, the truth of the matter is, if you give everybody real choice, eventually someone is going to choose to go against you. I oh, don't miss this. Eventually, if, it, if real free will has been given, somebody's going to choose to go against you. We'll talk more about that in a second. So that's why the plan of salvation was drafted and created before the world began. That's why it says that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation existed before man fell. Which speaks to, they say, well, why does evil exist? Evil didn't exist when God designed our redemption. Now, let's talk about God and love. 1 John 4, 16 and 17 says, and we, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is what? God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. You see this connection? God is love. If you dwell in God, you dwell in love. There's a reciprocal nature to the relationship that we have with God. He is love. And as we follow God and find him, we become love. Our characters become like his. He has a character of love. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we, that we may have boldness in the day of what? The day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, God loves us, and when we have accepted God and have his love, the thing that the atheist is trying to avoid, the accountability that comes from living a life. When you have God's love and you love God, you have no fear of the judgment, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The atheist, the evolutionist, when I was in school, what they taught is that literally you come from nothing. 
primordial sludge. And by a series of accidents, you come into being. And then they teach on the back end that eventually you, you cease to exist. They talk about asteroids hitting the earth and one day the sun's going to explode or however they design the end of the universe. Now they're talking about climate change and on the earth ending the earth. But either way, it's a meaningless beginning and a meaningless end. Here's where it gets difficult for them. Then why do you care about social justice? Why do you care about racism? Why do you care about uh, um, uh, materialism? Why do you care about the animals? Right? I mean, they, 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 have, they, um, they have people now talking about the sentient nature of fish. And how we shouldn't eat fish. Why should we harm the fish? Don't harm the fish. But what does it matter if we harm the fish if all of this is just going to die and blow up anyway? It's funny. People don't want to harm the fish, but they don't care if people harm people. On the day of judgment... We will have boldness if we have experienced God's love and reciprocated it. Here's what John goes on to say. He, has said, he said, I love this verse, John, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love does what? It casts out fear. Fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Here is the quintessential essence of the debate around evil in the world. Uh, see, if, if you have the love of God, you don't have fear. You think the opposite of love is hate. But from a kind of theological, biblical perspective, one of the opposites of love is fear. Is it a, is it a coincidence that we have an epidemic of anxiety, paranoia in this country? Depression? That as people have been taught systematically in the schools and in the entertainment industry and even in churches now that question the Bible? Is it a, is it a, is it a wonder that you live in a world where people live in constant fear? Because without God's love, what else is there to do but fear? There's no hope without God's love. We have a whole nation in America of people walking around with no hope. I see them as patients all the time, just wandering through this life. No hope for anything. The biggest thrill they have is to get, get to the weekend and have a few drinks. We love him because he first loved us. God cannot force you to love him. If he did, it would cease to be love. One of the books I was reading, they gave this analogy of how um, this couple was courting. And so, you know, weeks turned into months, turned into years. And after two or three years of dating and courting, um, the young lady figured out that the young man was going to pop the question. And she was so excited, got all prepared for it. Um, and one of her friends gave her the advice, you know, don't say yes right away. Um, you know, don't look desperate. You know, um, when he pops the question, tell him you're going to think about it. And so they go out to dinner and, and he, and, 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 you know, the, he gets on a knee and breaks out the diamond ring. And he's there and he's trembling and he pops the question. Sweetheart, will you marry me? And she looks him in the face and says, let me think about it. In this book on apologetics, or wherever I got this from, the guy jumps up, pulls out a gun and points it to her head and says, listen, you better say yes or else. Now, if she says yes, is that love? That's fear. Listen, I'd say yes. He put the gun to my head. I'd be like, <laughs> I'd say yes. Somebody call 911. God does not propose. God patiently waits for us, pleads with us. And that is why he cannot force love. 
So we said earlier that eventually, if you give everyone free will, and the reason you have to give free will is because God wants you to choose to love him, then eventually one would choose evil. Right? And so Satan, we'll talk more, we'll get into Lucifer here in a second. In heaven, he was the one who chose to go against God. You see, he couldn't, he said God's law is not fear. But let me say this, I know there's some scientists in the room. God's law is as protective to his universe as the laws of physics are. The natural laws, the laws that govern health in our bodies, the laws of, of, of gravity, the law that makes light travel at the speed it travels at, all of those laws that make the world inhabitable and the universe possible, all those physical laws, the moral law is just as necessary. So when Lucifer began to question God, question his law, he decided to say, this isn't fair. Why? We are smart enough. We can make decisions for ourselves. Here's what the Bible says. Isaiah 14 in verse 2, um, uh, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did make the nations which did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, here's where it comes from, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. How did sin enter God's perfect universe? One beautiful angel decided that it wasn't fear. It wasn't right that he was not exalted to the level of God. You see, Lucifer is one of the angels that covered. The other angel was the angel Michael, Christ himself. He began to believe that he should be equal with Michael, but Michael was equal with God. So what does Ezekiel say? Ezekiel says, son of man... Take up lament, Ezekiel 28, 12, son of man, take up lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God. Because Satan was the king of Tyrus. I could get deeper into that. But thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's how Lucifer was created. Thou hast been in the garden, in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Lucifer was a created being. Jesus says, I and my father are one. Right? Before the world was, he and the father were one. So Lucifer is not on Christ's level. He was created, but he was upset that he wasn't on that level. And the Bible says he was beautiful. I heard one preacher say, as he would stand in the presence of God with all these precious stones on, as Lucifer would turn, the, 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 the divine light would reflect off the stones. And some of the angels, when they would see that divine light, would, would bow or they would turn away. And Lucifer began to like the adoration he got. The scripture says, that he, the workmanship of his tablets and of his pipes was prepared in him. He was like a living, breathing, musical instrument. Ezekiel goes on to say, Thou art the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was the covering cherub. Verse 15, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in you. Where was iniquity found in him? So the question that people say is, God created sin. That's what one of my friends was responding to. Um, there's a, one, a young lady um, that was in um, the, the, the singing group uh, TLC. One of them is, uh, is Adventist or, or, or was raised Adventist and posted uh, Doug Batchelor and posted the thing on her on her page. My brother was showing this to me um, on her, on her um, I don't know if it was her what one of those social media sites um and so 
One of my friends responds on there and says, God created sin. Why is it a miracle that now he chooses to redeem you from sin? The Bible does not teach that God created sin. Iniquity was found in Lucifer. He chose to break God's law and rebel against God. God is not the author of evil, wickedness, and sin. Lucifer is. Satan is. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. That's how sin came into existence. If you don't understand this, you'll often be confused when you see terrible things happen in the world. You'll want to blame God, but understand God never designed for death to exist in this world. There was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden. There was never supposed to be death. God did not design the world to have suffering and pain. It was after the fall of man that these things came into existence. But it all started in heaven. Revelation 12 and verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Who was that great dragon? That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the, 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 the war went from heaven to where? To earth. Why then is there wickedness and sin on earth? Because Satan is here. And he wants to claim this earth as his own. Now watch this. Revelation 12, 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. It was at the cross Satan was put out of heaven, but at the cross, he was sealed from ever returning to heaven. That's why they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Now watch this. The warning we are given is here, Revelation 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Look at this. Woe, warning to those who inhabit the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having what? Great wrath. Because he knows that he has but a short time. So you've got to get it. So now the war happened in heaven. The devil's been cast down to earth. He's angry that he's lost his place. He wanted to be exalted above God and he got thrown down. And the only way, don't miss this church, the only way the enemy can get any revenge on God, the only way he can make uh, God suffer, as we're going to find out, is that cause as many people on earth to be lost as possible, to lead man into re uh, rebellion and revolution against the kingdom of God. So guess what? That is Satan's total work. I was going to put some stuff in there about the TV show Lucifer and all that, because what they're trying to do now is make Lucifer look like this not-so-dangerous character. That's the Luciferian movement TV shows like Lucifer, groups like the Satanic Temple in Salem, Massachusetts, um, they're moving to try and change the very image of Lucifer because eventually the Bible tells us he is going to come to earth as an angel of light. He will impersonate Christ. And he is going to bring some master deception like he did back in Genesis. How did sin and evil get to earth? Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God set up a test, but he didn't tempt. Satan did the tempting. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, Ye shall not surely die. Remember, he can lie. So he did. His first great lie, you will not. And to this day, people still believe that you're not going to die, that you can come back as a ghost and all this kind of stuff. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan makes the lie even more robust. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and she ate it. Gave also unto her husband with her, and what happened? And he ate it. She was deceived. Adam was not. The sin falls not on Eve, uh, you know, proportionately. It falls on Adam. Now watch this. Romans 5 and verse 12 says this. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have done what? All have sinned. Why is there wicked and evil in the world? You can follow the trail. All the way from Satan's revolution and rebellion in heaven, where he took a third of the angels, all of them cast to the earth. They get to earth. They convince man to join the rebellion. And because man now is willing to break God's law, all of the peace and protection that the law of God provides is lifted. And in one generation from Eve eating that fruit, one of her sons murders the other one. You see, when the law of God is thrown aside, you get what we have in this world. Constant news feeds of murder, suicides, and, 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 and crafty, um, dangerous practices, uh, fires in apartment buildings. It broke my heart the last couple of weeks. Big fires in these apartment buildings, natural disasters, because when God's law is disobeyed, the world begins to unravel. Spirit of Prophecy says this, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 26. Even when he was cast out of heaven, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Because what people say is, well, why didn't God just wipe Satan out? Why not just remove the problem? Because that's what we would do. Infinite, uh, uh, infinite wisdom did not destroy Satan. Follow me here. Since only the service of love can be acceptable to God, the allegiance of his creatures must rest upon a conviction of his justice and benevolence. The inhabitants of heaven and of the worlds, being unprepared to comprehend the nature or consequences of sin, could not then have seen the justice of God in the destruction of Satan. Had he been immediately blotted out of existence, some would have served God from fear rather than from love. The influence of the deceiver would not have been fully destroyed, nor would the spirit of rebellion have been utterly eradicated. For the good of the entire universe, through ceaseless ages, he must more fully develop his principles, that his charges against the divine government might be seen in their true light by all created beings." and that the justice and mercy of God and the immutability of his law might be forever placed beyond all question. You get that? If God just wiped Satan out, everybody else would have been like, whoa, that was a gangster move. He just took Satan, just asked a few questions and he killed him. God had to allow the rebellion to run its course. This is why God doesn't just give us free choice he doesn't stop the consequences of man's choice. If every time man was about to do something evil, God stepped in and stopped the consequence, the universe would never know the full weight of sin. So, how do we make sense of evil in this world? A few things, and then we're done. Number one, sin and evil are allowed so they never exist again. And that's what we just read. God allows the evil in the world, the sin in the world, the pain in the world, the pain I felt when I've had to bury loved ones. The challenges I had in medical school on the trauma, when I did my trauma surgery rotation, watching body after body in Miami come and shot up. Seeing the, 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 what happens the, the, when violence just runs amok. And you say, where is God in all of this? God is allowed, and it's a difficult concept to get, but if God does not allow sin to run its course, it would raise itself up again. This is what Nahum 1 says in verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. We have a hope 
that the pain we're exi- that we uh, are experiencing in this world, that if we are faithful to God and among the redeemed, will, we will live with God forever and never know one plant to die. Never mind a person. What is the Satan's end? Thou, back to Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28, 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries uh, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, speaking of Satan. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be anymore. This is why I say, when you hear me preach, I say, if when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. This is his future. God is going to call a fire from inside Lucifer to consume him and then cast him into a lake of fire. He's going to be double baked. Proverbs 16 and verse 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself. This is our scripture reading. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God has allowed these things to happen because the day is going to come when God is going to set the world back straight. He's allowed all of this to happen. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. Great controversy. Page 88. The whole universe will have become witnesses to the nature and results of sin and its utter extermination which in the beginning would have brought fear to angels and dishonor to God, will now vindicate his love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will and and whose heart is his law. Never will evil again be manifest. Says the word of God, affliction shall not rise up the second time. Nahum 1.9, the law of God, which Satan has reproached as the yoke of bondage, will be honored as the law of liberty. A tested and proved creation will never again be turned from allegiance to him whose character has been fully manifested before them as fathomless love and infinite wisdom. Why is there evil and wickedness in the world? God has allowed it so it never happens again. Number two, to make sense of evil and wickedness in the world, understand that God suffers with us. God suffers with us. Psalms 56 and verse 8 says, Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Listen, when I went through some trial, this psalm, I I, I would study the psalms. Whenever I'm going through difficult times, psalms is the book I go to. And I remember reading this in the middle of one of my difficulties, thinking that God had forgotten me, that he that he, had lost everything. And I thought, well, God has just given up on me. He's lost me. And I read in Psalm 56 and verse 8, Uh, Thou tellest my wanderings. You know where I've been, Lord. Put my tears in your bottle. But then David says something profound. My tears, my sufferings are already written in God's book. There's nothing you're going through, no terror, no tragedy, no trauma you've been through that God has not suffered with you. It has been written in the book. That's why Luke 19, 41, Jesus goes over Jerusalem. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he did what? Wept over it. Jerusalem represents the world. Jesus looks at the world. He weeps over it. When he stood at Lazarus' tomb, what did he do? He wept. Was he weeping for Lazarus? Probably not. He was about to call Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus wept because he felt every funeral you've been at, every loss you've ever had. He wept because he understood that man does not uh, appreciate the depth of what God has gone through to redeem him. And man would rather wallow in sin and shame than turn, repent, and be with God. He wept. Here's what he said, Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Again, if you take Jerusalem to represent the world, it gets deep. 
Because the world with all the apostles and prophets, all the preachers that have come, all the truth that has been revealed, we have rejected them and have persecuted them and persecution will return. And rather than turn to God, they will reject them. Christ weeps over them. In fact, the destruction of the wicked, which will be necessary. And you know why the destruction of the wicked is necessary? Because God is life. If you reject God, you reject life. It is God's mercy that we sinful creatures even draw breath. Because if he pulled away from us, like he should because we're full of sin, we would all drop dead. He allows us to live. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wrought as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work. His what? His strange work. And bring to pass his act, his strange act. The destruction of the wicked is God's strange act. God is a God of love, a God who creates. But if you decide to remove yourself from God, you have chosen death. In fact, hell isn't that you burn in fire. Hell is that you are separated from God. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? That's what God says. Say of the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. God gets no, God doesn't rejoice. He's not happy the way that the world wants to paint him as if he uh, enjoys wiping out the wicked. God is going to hurt more than any that his children have chosen to not accept him. Third reason, God allowed wickedness and evil in this word is that God will tabernacle with us. It is because, it is because of sin, Christ came to redeem us. And in the process of redeem, redeeming man, Jesus has been made closer to us than if we had never sinned. He will tabernacle with us. Revelation 21, 3 and 4 says this. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What tears? The tears that were stored in that bottle. The, tour, the tears that were written in that book. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. God is going to tabernacle. Was when we see Jesus in heaven and we reach to grab his hand, the nail prints, the scars will still be there. He will be eternally human because of what has happened on this earth. And earth will truly be made the throne room of his entire universal kingdom. The wickedness we see when God is done. And when we stand on the streets of gold, overlooking the sea of glass, we'll look at each other and say, man, what we went through on earth was nothing compared to what God gave us. Ecclesiastes 3.11 he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. He will make all things beautiful. He will tabernacle with us. But the last one is this one. Why does God allow the wickedness in this world? Why doesn't he just cut this thing short and come back? To allow for redemption. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter says, listen, Jesus, God's not slack. He's not, he's not, he's not, he's not, he's not um, messing around. He's not somewhere playing around and not doing what he's supposed to do, like some men are, but he's long-suffering. He's trying to save as many as possible. Hoping, rather than perish, we would come to repentance. Deuteronomy 30, 15, see, I have set before thee this day. He gave us the freedom of choice. I've set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, 
to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 19 says, I call, Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed, that both you and your offspring may live. Today, he has set before you a choice. We get to choose. Just to wrap up the story, John 9, 3, Jesus answered, neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God can take the mess of this world and make something beautiful. Then he says, John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, look at what Jesus does. He spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. Let me tell you something, when it's all over, God is going to have made everything right. That takes faith. But as we've been talking about in the series, it's not blind faith. You can trust God and his word. He cannot lie. He cannot break a promise. I'll close with an interesting story from Rwanda and when Rwanda had its genocide, um, there was, a, there was a, a pastor and his wife that when the one tribe fell on the other tribe and began to slaughter them, they took the church members, the Adventist church, they took the church members into the church to hide, thinking that the mob um, with machetes and, 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 and bats and all the things that they had to, to harm people with, that they would not come into the church and do such a thing. There were dozens in the church. And as they pressed back up against this side of the church near the rostrum, the mob came in, wielding their machetes, their cutlasses. The pastor who went to try and defend his congregation, as his wife was behind him, she saw him take the cutlass and deliver a death blow to her husband, and he fell. She began to scream, no. And as she looked up, the cutlass was coming down on her head, straight in her forehead. True story. She lost consciousness. And while she was out, she didn't really, uh, most of those in the room were also killed. It was a while, days, before anybody came to check to see if there were any living among the collection of bodies in that church. And as they went through removing the dead, when they got to her, she still had a faint pulse. She was taken to the hospital and she was nursed back to health. She still had a giant scar down the middle of her forehead where that machete hit her. When she got better, she realized, of course, she had lost her husband and most of the congregants in the church, many of the neighbors in the neighborhood that had run into the church for refuge had all died. She made it her life's work. She began to go into the prisons where the people who did this atrocity were now being held. And she began to bring food to those prisoners. When it got cold, she brought blankets into the prison. Eventually, they trusted her, and she began to do Bible studies in the prison. Here now, the very people who had destroyed her church, her life, and taken her husband's life, here now, she ministered to them. And she, as she was walking across the courtyard of the prison one day, a young man came running and fell on his knees in front of her sobbing and crying. 
She said, young man, what, what are you doing? And he said, thank you. She said, I do this out of the goodness of my heart or, or you know, for God's work. She, she, she started to explain. He said, no, don't you recognize me? As he sobbed, he looked up at her and said, I am the one who killed your husband. It was my machete that went into your forehead. And she lifted the young man up and forgave him. She began to have Bible study with the young man. And the young man was baptized into the church. Eventually, it was time for him to be released, but he had no family. This woman adopted him as her own son. Pastor Mark Finley tells the story that when he goes to the house, she show, he, the lady shows him the picture of the assailant who, uh, um, of, of, her, of, of her son and explains to Mark Finley that the, that, that is the, the, the same person who killed her husband. And the, little, and the young man walks out of the back bedroom. Let me tell you something. This world is full of atrocity. But I have been convinced in my walk that as painful as this life is, God's love is still more powerful. And in the scope of eternity... No matter how much you've suffered, no matter how much pain you've gone through, no matter how much disappointment you've experienced, when you step back and look at eternity, in the end, God's love will win. Ah, don't give up because the world tells you to. Church, I challenge you. Defend the faith. Hold on to God. His love will win. And one day, we will meet him in the clouds of glory and we will forever be with our God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study a word, and to deal with this subject. I pray, Lord, in a special way that each one of us would not give up on your love, not let go of your hand, but instead, Lord, we would repent, turn to you and be saved. No one, Lord, has suffered more than you. The abuse you met in Jerusalem before Calvary and on the cross itself, the beating, the taunting, the way that you were uh, uh, put to shame. Father God, no human has gone through what Christ went through. So yes, there's evil in the world, but no one has experienced it or carried it like Jesus has. So Father God, we rest in this hope that just as Jesus overcame, we will overcome. Father God, help us to stay strong in the faith. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen and amen. Melvi Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe, and to click the bell. My friend, thank you so much. You've taken your time to watch this video. You've been blessed. You've been wondering how do we get to create such videos and share them to you for free? No, 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 no. They are not for free, my friends. We do spend a lot of time, money, and equipment to generate these videos, and that's why I'm here to invite you, if you have not already done so, to subscribe to Melville Broadcasting Network, particularly to join this YouTube channel and all our other platforms and send us your donations. So please click the join button and send us your monthly donations. You can also go to PayPal. If you're out of Africa or wherever, you can send us your PayPal donation. Just go to the details that we're showing you down there and send us your donations on a monthly basis. Obviously, we also have a bank account. I've put the details right there. Send us your donations so that we can do these and many more projects we have of quality media products. We really want to use this platform to prepare you, your family, your friends, and your colleagues to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. He is about to come. 
And this is a small opportunity you and I have to use your blessing to bless us that we may bless others. So God bless you as you consider sponsoring this ministry. Melville Broadcasting Network is a divine voice out of Africa. God bless you.